This is uh, Laws 13013, Legal Professional Conduct, Week 3, looking at tutorial problems 9 through to 11. All right, um, it's good to see everybody. How's it going? Are you keeping up to date with the course so far? Everything okay? No major problems? No? Um, this week's not too bad. Admission is, is relatively straightforward. Um, next week's a little bit more difficult because there's so many elements to it. And we've got the um, uh, Stafford Shepherd coming from the Law Society as well that eats into our time. So uh, one of the suggestions I had from um, a student this week was whether uh, you were interested in having a slightly longer tutorial next week. I don't know whether you've got other classes that interfere with that. Or whether that's something you want to do, because normally I what I would yeah, go after, on. so that's I have literally one from eight till nine, which is you, and then one from nine till ten. So it's okay. So that won't work for you. And um, Steve, and I know there's some people who are in employment at the moment before this lesson as well. Okay, all right. Well, look, what I usually do. Well, having said that, I don't usually have a situation where we have a guest speaker. <laughs> Um, and this is one of those really regulated courses where we have to have all of the content in it to meet the requirements for admission. So I can't take anything out of it. So we're sort of locked in this sort of situation. So um, what I might do is release answer guides for all of those problems. But what I, what I would say to you, with the trust accounting stuff, you really need to spend the time and work your way through the exercises. It's the only way you can get... Um, practice with the accounting so that you can see how it actually works because it is slightly different from normal accounting if any of you've got experience with accounting but I you know I've set it out in a way that's um, pretty easy to follow but you know um, not everybody's accountants is an accountant so you have to get used to that um, it's quite funny because the Council of Australian Law Deans many years ago um, argued with the LPABs in the different states to try and take accounting out of the out of the the requirement for the Priestly Eleven. So, and uh, what they did is um, <clears throat> largely they managed to shift it into PLT, Graduate Diploma of Legal Practice. But there's still a few of us who actually know how to do the accounting. <laughs> I'm one of them, and and so is um, Reed Mortensen at USQ. We wrote a book on trust accounting, so we actually do do the accounting. So. Um, you're probably thinking, oh, God, why are we doing the accounting? It will make life a lot easier when you get to um, the PLT course because you will breeze right through it because you will actually have the experience and know how it all works. And you'll see your um, contemporaries in that course really struggling. So that's why we keep it in. Uh, a lot of offer. Sorry, go on. Yep. I was just going to ask, for the purpose of the, the quiz that we're doing, will we have to be able to do that? A trust accounting for that? No, you won't actually. You not, you don't have time to do the trust accounting. No, I didn't think so. But no. as long as we do the workbook stuff and get our yeah. head around, you need it. to understand the theory of it. So we teach the theory of it, and there'll be questions about that in the actual um, quiz. But doing the physical accounting takes longer, so we don't put that in the quiz. It's too difficult, and can't do it in the time frame. But you do need to understand it. And I know a lot of law firms, <clears throat> or most law firms, will use uh, electronic systems for their accounting. But um, at the end of the day, you're liable for the trust account and what happens within it, or at least your partners will be, and they'll be relying on you. Uh, so you need to be aware of what's required for trust accounting. So if you see something that's wrong, you actually can identify what's wrong and, and don't fall into some of the traps. So that's why we do the basic accounting. So you get the idea of how it works. So do persevere with that. It takes a little bit of time. People don't necessarily get it first time when they go through it. But um, you will get it and it will help you, especially when you do your PLT. Okay, so that's my justification for it. And I know that's the case because I've taught this many, many times over the years. And that's what we do find. And I hear it from students who do the PLT course, how they appreciate it doing the trust accounting side of it. Although perhaps not at the time of doing this unit, but you'll see. You'll also find when you do go into practice and coming from smaller firms, anyhow, you, you are required to know how to do a trust account authority, know the time parameters, understand when you can and cannot release money out of that trust account. Um, it's just an everyday practice that you do need to know. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And most 
law firms are small firms. Yeah. You know. Are there a, any videos that we can watch that are really good at like prompting us around it, like any anything that's recorded from CQU or working not through? Not really. Um, I wrote a computer program years ago. That's <laughs> I don't know if that's still available. I have to have a look that actually stepped you through the processes. But in reality, if you follow those tutorial questions and then if you have a go at them yourself first, that, I think that's really important. Have a go you, yourself just working through the problem and then have a look at how the answers are structured. The other really good resource is that trust accounting uh, book that the Law Society has produced. That's really good and they update that regularly. Uh, that that's got it's just full of worked examples all the way through it. So if you work your way through those, um, look, you you're going to be more than capable of doing the trust accounting at the end of it. Um, I'll have a look and see if I've still got that computer program I wrote years ago. <laughs> um, but you don't really need it. It's it's just a case of sitting down and working through the exercises, and then it'll after a while it becomes sort of second nature to you. Okay. All right, well, um, this week is important because it's about admission and most, if not all of you, will want to get admitted. Um, there is a really a requirement for you to be admitted within five years after you, you get your law degree. So don't delay your admission beyond that or you might run into problems actually getting admitted. Um, so it's worthwhile getting admitted. So we're going to look at the process and some of the issues around that. Um, some of you might have some problems that come up with suitability, and which we'll look at, and we can judge the severity or or how you get around those issues. But um, so we've got three exercises. Uh, so we'll start with uh, question nine. I did put together an animation, I think, on this once, which was on the site as well. Um, so what we've got is uh, Elizabeth, who's interested in politics and the environment. Uh, six months prior to seeking admission, she's arrested for. Um, for resisting arrest and assaulting a police officer. She's chained herself to the farm gate, which is having um, coal seam gas well put on it. Um, she's got her case, which was set down during the final week of the PLT course. Uh, she then decides to, that spitting on a police officer at a G20 political rally three months ago was a good idea. Um, then she's got offensive language to another police officer the Save the Whale rally two months ago. So there's a whole litany of history of various things. She pleads not guilty to various things, nevertheless was convicted and fined on each occasion with a local magistrate. Um, then she calls the magistrate a tool of the establishment and bias in favour of the police, and then she gets fined for contempt. Um, so she's not having a, a very good time uh, in terms of managing her approach to the police, to magistrates, etc. So... Uh, she now wants to get admitted. She's seeking your advice um, on how she can get admitted, so what the process is, but also what she can do to mitigate any concerns that the board may have. Okay? So ultimately, it's the Supreme Court that admits you. Okay? It's not the board, but the board advises the Supreme Court on... Um, you know, they do all of the, the sort of paperwork, checking out all sorts of things. So, you know, they, they're very thorough. So they'll look right through your law degree and they'll look at credit assessments that you may have had from if you've come, you know, done some subjects elsewhere. They check everything very thoroughly to make sure you've done the right units, you haven't missed anything, that you've done your PLT, et cetera. So they're very, they're very thorough. Um, and they're also very interested in finding out any issues around suitability. So on occasions, um, speaking from experience, we've had complaints against various students which have gone to the board, so they'll investigate things like that. Um, but that's not that common. Um, I was on a board, the New South Wales board, for I think it was at least nine years from memory. So I got to see all the sorts of things that, that went through the New South Wales equivalent of the Queensland LPAB. Um, and we'll have a look at some of those things tonight. The um, Law Admissions Consultative Committee, that's LAC, which is made up of representatives of each of the LPABs in the different jurisdictions, um, it put out some guidelines, which I've given you links to, 
which are very useful as well in looking at these suitability matters and things that you need to disclose. Um, but at the end of the day, it's uh, best to disclose absolutely everything that you can think of that may impact on admission. Um, so that, uh, and also make sure that those disclosures are made to any people who are writing references for you. The worst case scenario is where you fail to disclose something, the LPAB finds that out and then quizzes your referees who also you haven't told about it. So the problem with that is it's seen as a form of dishonesty and that can prevent you from being admitted. So you need to be upfront about everything. And we'll see that in the examples today. Stephen, okay. With yep. regards to your family, so mm -hmm. do you have to disclose anything about Say, for example, you had a family member that had committed a crime or been convicted of something, like ah. your immediate family. It's just you personally. It's just you. Yeah, okay. Because they're looking at your suitability, not yep. anybody else's. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so how are you going to answer this first problem? How are you going to break it up? What's the two natural halves of this problem we've got to deal with? Wouldn't you advise her to uh, seek admission to apply for early consideration of suitability? Uh, you could have done that earlier on, but she's already finished her law degree. She's already finished PLT. But what you're suggesting is something you would do a lot earlier, right back when, you know, ideally before, they, before she'd started her law degree or at least during the law degree when some of these things have happened. The idea behind that is that um, it uh, you can make that application, get a ruling, and you avoid all of the costs associated with admission because it's quite expensive when you add it all up. And we'll look at the costs as well this evening. So that's the idea. And it might be that it's better to then delay admission for a period of time so that you can then sort of mount an argument, well, you know, there hasn't been any issues over the past, you know, four years or five years. Um, so it lends this sort of notion that you are a reformed person. That's the sort of idea behind that. Okay, all right. So just putting that aside, so the, the two bits are eligibility and for admission and then suitability. So what do you need to be eligible for admission? You need to have completed a law degree from an accredited uh, college or something, you know? Yeah, you've got to complete a law degree from an accredited um, Australian law school. And we'll talk about the international stuff a little bit later. What else? Do your, your practical, practical legal training. training. You've got to complete your practical legal training course again by an accredited provider. All right, what else? Must be a fit and proper person. Okay, well, that becomes, uh, yeah, that's really getting into suitability. How old do you have to be? At least 18. Okay, you've got to be 18. You've got to be a natural person, so you can't admit a corporation. Um, okay, so um, I think we can assume all of that in relation to Elizabeth in terms of her age. We're not told what her age is. Um, but we're told that she's completed PLT, she's done a law degree. So I think all of that sort of stuff is okay. So really her problems relate to this second requirement of suitability. So where do we look to work out what the requirements are for suitability? How do we know she's a, you know, a fit and proper person? So I think the yeah, go on. I think the legal board has got guidelines, the admission guidelines. There, that's so right. We should, we should be able to look at that, and that will define what are the minimum requirements in terms of suitability as well. In in addition to eligibility, but you've got to look to the legislation as well, because the legislation is where you go. That's more important than guidelines. Isn't it the Legal Profession Act Part Two Point Two Division Two? That's right. So there's two sections, isn't there? So what, what sections do we need to look at? Thirty-two, thirty-three. Well, 
That's 31. Yeah, 31. 31 is better because 31 talks about suitability for admission. Okay, so I'll just tell you what that says. It says a person is suitable for admission to the legal profession under this act only if the person is a fit and proper person to be admitted. So that's where that fit and proper requirement is. That's subsection one. And then subsection two, in deciding if a person is fit and proper person to be admitted, the Supreme Court, so it doesn't say the board does it, it says the Supreme Court must consider, so it's mandatory, it's got must in it, A, each of the suitability matters in relation to the person to the extent a suitability matter is appropriate, okay, and B, other matters that the Supreme Court considers relevant. And then, so, so you see there, there's a few things. You've got to look at the suitability matters and then any other matter the court, Supreme Court considers relevant. That's pretty broad, isn't it? Um, so the board is going to advise the Supreme Court on those issues. All right. So, and then subsection three, 31 subsection three, however, the Supreme Court may consider a person to be a fit and proper person to be admitted to the legal profession under this act, despite a suitability matter because of the circumstances relating to the matter. So you might have a situation where you have a suitability issue. Classic one is plagiarism, because that is a, leads to an inference of dishonesty. But nevertheless, the Supreme Court under 31.3 can still consider somebody to be fit and proper and admit them, even though they've got a suitability issue. Okay, so the fact you've got a suitability issue doesn't necessarily prevent you from being, being admitted, but it's certainly not going to help you. Okay, so there's a few ways. So you can see that opens up wriggle room for somebody to argue, oh, well, yes, I did you know, have that problem, but um, I'm now reformed. That was years ago. You know, I was young and silly. Um, you know, I haven't done anything since. Those sort of arguments. Okay. So the question then is, what is a suitability matter? And it's actually defined in the Act. So where do we go for looking at the definition of a suitability matter? I would have said case law is part of it. Uh, case, law case law is definitely law part, of part of it. Let's so start with the legislation. <laughs> so which part of the which part of this um, act do we need to look at for suitability? This is actually defined. We have a look in section nine. In so nine? Yeah. So I'll show. I should put the chat on. That might help. <laughs> Picking up that. Okay. So if I go share screen and we have a look at. Uh, let's see. That'll be it. Section nine, there's a whole host of things here. So you can see there, let's have a look through this. Each of the following is a suitability matter. So it's something that needs to be considered. Whether the person is currently of good fame and character. Okay, well, that is basically the sort of what's company you know, that's the equivalent of fit and proper almost is a good fame and character. Whether they've been an insolvent under administration. So if you've got a you know bankruptcy situation, that can um, be a problem with admission. Whether you've been convicted of an offence in Australia, but look, it's broader than that, or a foreign country. And if that's the case, the nature of it, how long ago was it, and how old were you? So you know these are all areas for wiggle, wiggle room if you've got one of these problems, isn't it? You can start to say, oh, it was a long time ago. It wasn't very serious. Um, and I was very young. All of those sort of things counter the, the inference that you that um, it sort of downgrades the, the severity of what the suitability matter might be. Um, whether the person engaged in legal practice in Australia. Now, you might think, why are they engaging in legal practice? Believe it or not, we have had students, and I've seen it in other law schools, who start engaging in legal practice before they finish their law degree. Um, so this has been written in there. Where, whether the person engaged in legal practice in Australia when not admitted to the profession or not holding a practicing certificate, okay? If admitted to the legal profession, uh, profession in contravention of a condition on which the admission was granted, so if there was, say, they had a conditional admission that then went beyond that, um, 
or doing, you know, if their practicing certificate was suspended, all of those sort of situations. So that's legal practice in Australia. Then you've got this next one is foreign country. Whether the person has practiced law in a foreign country and we're not permitted to do so under a law of that country. And we've seen instances of that in Australia when somebody is doing a law degree and they're still a student and yet they've started opening a law practice in another country. That certainly has happened. Um, uh, whether the person is currently subject to an unresolved complaint investigation charge or order under any relevant law corresponding law corresponding foreign law. That's pretty broad. Complaint investigation or charge under any relevant law. Relevant law could extend beyond the legal profession. For example, you might have been in another profession and have a you know misconduct matter under that other profession, and then you've decided to get out of that profession and enroll in law and then try and enter the legal profession, well, your history can catch up with you. Um, whether the person is subject to current disciplinary action in Australia or overseas, has had disciplinary action relating to another profession or occupation involving a finding of guilt. So you can see it's pretty broad, isn't it? When, you know, what, what you've done in Australia and overseas, whether in, the, in relation to the legal profession or otherwise, uh, if you've been removed from a role or a foreign role, when I say role, that's the role of admission. So if you've been admitted somewhere else. Um, if your right to legal practice has been suspended for cancer in Australia or, over, or a foreign country. Um, look at this one. A person has contravened in Australia or a foreign country a law about trust money or trust accounts. See, it's not limited just to legal trust, you know, law firm trust accounts. That's very broad. Um, and then law of Commonwealth corresponding law manager, receiver um, has been appointed to any legal practice engaged in by the person. So that's where you've run a practice and then it's become insolvent and the receiver and manager appointed, something like that. Um, you've been disqualified from being employed um, or being a partner of a law firm. Etc. So that's you. anyway. The main thing there is you can see how broad all of those suitability matters are. So you've really got to have a good look back through your past and see whether you fall within any um, any of these things. Um, and also applies to anything that happened before the commencement of this act. So it's retrospective as well. All right. So I'll stop sharing it now. So what? We don't go to Stephen. Sorry. Yeah, go on. They've got number one uh, P, a matter declared under an act to be a suitability matter. That is extremely broad, is it not? It is. Yeah, it is. So when you look at that in totality, it's a pretty thorough examination of what you've done in the past. Um, so that's why you need, if you've got anything you concerned about, you need to bring it forward and explain it. And for most things, it's it's not going to be a problem. Um, and even if you have an area where it is a problem, it may have been so long ago, um, a one-off instance, et cetera. Um, Stephen. So, go on, yep. There's, there's a question in chat and I had the same question. Uh, things are so broad, uh, foreign countries, all sorts of stuff here. How is that policed? I mean, uh, well, the, the, the APA oh, wouldn't know yeah. until we tell them, right? The obligation is on you to tell them. Now, if it was in some foreign country and um, no one else knows about it and you've kept it hidden, um, then maybe no one will ever find out about it. But if they do find out about it and it's brought to the attention of the law society, um, you will be effectively struck off. That will be the result because of dishonesty, failing. You know, it's a clear breach of the act, failing to bring forward a suitability matter. So you run the risk. That's the downside. So it's, it is an honesty system, but, you know, it'd be, it, it's pretty hard in this day and age, isn't it, with the internet, because so much stuff gets put on the internet. You might have got away with that more so in the past, but given that everything is pretty well captured electronically one way or another, it'd be very difficult to um, avoid that unless you've changed your name or, you know, I tried to hidden it. 
uh, tried to hide that. And if you've done those sort of things, it just adds more to the case that you're being dishonest by trying to conceal something. So I think yeah. there's a trust thing here. I mean, the whole whole profession based on trust and morals and values and ethics. So, but Jane, you know, I just wanted to know because you can't really police. I mean, you got to become up honest and then just take it on your chin and see what it is, right? Basically. Rather fight it than, than, than be found out later. Yeah, being found out later, you you just cannot win that. There's no way. There's you know that just it's plain dishonesty, and then you you just can't get around that issue. Whereas if it's brought up and um, the board considers it, you know, there's a, a myriad of things that could fall within that. that at least you can pound arguments and um, and um, hopefully overcome whatever it is. But if you don't do that and you hide it, conceal it, and get found out, you you're just dead in the water that point um so who wants to have that risk all right so um the whole notion it's a negative test you're assumed to be of good fame and character unless otherwise proved okay so at least you start off without having to prove that you're of good fame and character that is just assumed what you've got to um do is to answer or bring up any any sort of these suitability matters and then address them okay now, the LAC, as I said before, has disclosure guidelines. So I just wanted to raise a couple of the really classic ones that come up. Social security overpayments or offences is a really common one for students. So, and it, it's quite easy to fall into that trap because with Centrelink and those sort of organisations, you've got to continually advise them whatever your income is. And if you're in some sort of shift work, you can find yourself in a situation where there's an overpayment. It's, it's not hard to fall, you know, to fall in that situation. So if there has been an overpayment, it is best to come clean and repay the money before Centrelink takes you to court and prosecutes you. If it does go to court and Centrelink uh, does prosecute you, in that scenario, you come clean again and seek to repay the money. But that's a common one. Um, academic misconduct is another fairly common one. Uh, so plagiarism, that's why we're always harping on about plagiarism, because it does have serious consequences for admission for law graduates. Uh, it's not uncommon for law graduates to be delayed six months in their admission if there's plagiarism. So, you know, six months delay, if, you know, there's a loss of salary, it's pretty substantial consequence. That's why we're always on about don't plagiarise or um, find yourself in that situation of any academic misconduct because it has to be disclosed. Even if you're in the job and you're already admitted and something happens, you've still got to go to the um, QLS and let them know that something's happened and, or write a letter, haven't you? Yeah. So what you should do in that sort of situation is that they have senior counsellors who act as advisors. Mm -hmm. So what I would do, I mean, you can talk to your partner and your law firm. However, if it's something involving them, um, mm -hmm. like, for example, if they've asked you to backdate a document, that's a classic one. Um, you're sort of in a bind, you know, you, you've got this pressure from the partner saying, date the thing this date. And you've got the other side of your ethics obligations where you can't do that. And then if you don't do it, then you're sort of got this situation where you're at loggerheads with your, your boss. So that sort of situation is where you need to talk to a senior counsellor because you don't want to commit the offence of uttering because that's what it is, backdating documents. It's a dishonesty. You get struck off for that. So um, you don't want to risk that. Um, I had that happen to me, actually, when I was in a law firm, and it was a big law firm too. Uh, partner tried to do that and I refused to do it. But um, anyway, it sort of, um, so there was no offence committed, but, you know, the relationship was a bit strained for a while. But, um, yeah, it does happen. So you just got to be strong in those situations. Um, You're protected, though, aren't you, as a whistleblower? Like, because you sort of, you have some protection against your employer, don't you? Or yeah, do, but, I mean, in reality, whether you do or you don't, it's hard. Especially if you're in a law in a little law firm. Um, yep, hang on, are we frozen. Okay, hang on a second. Are we back in the room? 
Yeah, <laughs> we sort of froze there for a second. I don't know why. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, in a small law firm, it's really problematic because if there's only a couple of partners, for example, and yourself, you know, it does strain the relationship. But then again, um, you've just got to be firm and just say no to those sort of situations. But it's important that you recognise them so you don't inadvertently, you know, do something that you shouldn't. Um, but you just have to be strong and people will respect you at the end of the day if you maintain your ethical standards. If you start to slip on those, then it, you get a reputation um, around the traps. People begin to notice things uh, and you don't really want to get that reputation. All right. Um, other sorts of things, any sort of criminal conduct, you want to try and avoid that. Um, Lots of traffic offences, especially if it involves drink driving. You want to avoid that. Never make a false statutory declaration. Try and avoid committing a tax offence. That's always a, a, not a good idea. Um, so they're the main sorts of ones. Just, you know, and they're pretty obvious, but um, you need to be careful with all, all of those sorts of things. All right. Okay. So. Um, there is an admission kit that the that um, if you go on the Law Society site or the LPAB site, which I think is associated with the Law Society site, it sort of sets out all of the things required for admission. Um, but one of the things you do is you actually have to certify that you're not aware of any suitability matters, or if you are, you have to specify what they are. And that's where you put in all of the information. And again, make sure you tell anybody who's writing you a reference they need to be aware of these things. Uh, you might say, well, well I'm not, you know, I don't really want them to be aware of these things, but um, the actual board will be looking to see references to these things in those um, references. I am aware of these suitability matters, but and then you have the other side of it, oh, I haven't had any problem with this particular person, you know, blah, blah, blah. So would it be fair to say you give them a copy to your referee to, of what yeah. you've done as your application so they're from a disclosure point of view? Absolutely. You, you should do that. Hmm. You should do that. And then there's no question about that issue. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's have a look at this particular person. So she's got some political activity. So um, what do you think about that? Is that a problem for her? There is case. Uh, <clears throat> You're not going to, she'll have to wait time. <laughs> well, it's in the case, there's a few things to note about the case law. You've always got to look at it in terms of the historical period in which it happened, because some of that case law is pretty old. Um, so in Re Julius, that's, that was in 1943. But back in 1943, it was all about, um, you know, reds under the bed and, you know, um, People were concerned about um, communism. So this particular person was a member of the Communist Party, but nevertheless, they got admitted. Okay, despite a lot of angst in the, you know, in society at the time. Um, um, so gay and lesbian and environmental cases, probably not going to really cause any problem that those sort of protesting in relation to those sort of issues. I don't think so. Re B is another case, 1981. Um, what about that case? Did you have a look at Reed B? Now that was where the political activist was not allowed. It's contrary to Reed Julius. Yes, that, that one was an interesting case. You need to have a good read of that case. Was that Wendy Bacon case? Yes. Yeah, yeah I read that. Yeah. Now, Wendy Bacon went, you know, in terms of radicalism, she went all out. So I think the problem for her um, they they uh, held basically that her activities were incompatible with being a barrister. But you need to look at it. She was really extreme. Um, so um, wasn't, wasn't it more about the the proceeds where she got for the bail? Yeah, she she yeah. There were all sorts of dishonesty issues associated with it as well. But pure radicalism. Um, as long as you're not committing other offences, like you're not attacking the police, or um, if you just if it's a if it's a a um, a, a demonstration, um, 
but it doesn't end up in violence um, or you haven't committed any sort of violent act, then you're probably okay on those sorts of things. It's when you start to um, commit offences like assaulting police. So, you know, somebody spitting at police would be in, you know, an assault type situation. Um, that's, uh, you know, it sort of tends to suggest a disregard for the law. So in those sort of situations, you've then got to look at, well, how long ago was that? How old was this person? You know, um, have, is there no escalating pattern of this? Uh, or is there a de-escalation and you know, now they've got a clean sort of record? Um, so our particular person's got a few problems, haven't they, if you look through what they've done? Um, because it's, it's really, you know, three months ago, the G20, she spat on the police officer. That's three months ago. Then two months ago, she's got offensive language. And then, uh, you know, she's committing contempt of court. She's got real problems. So I don't think she would be admitted. Um, she would get delayed. And when we say delay, it doesn't prevent her from applying for admission at a later date. It's just that she's not getting admitted at that particular on that particular application. So she would have to spend a period of time where she, you know, my advice to her is don't commit any of these acts. Um, you know, um, start engaging in community service. Uh, get a, a job that, uh, not necessarily with a law firm, but with other firms that involve trust uh, so that you can point to these things and say, well, I'm, you know, reformed. That's the sort of thing you'd have to you'd have to say to her because um, I think she would have real problems. Um, so and that's... Getting arrested that's, as well. Like getting arrested would be a problem in itself, wouldn't it? Whether well, it she certainly be. have to. She, she certainly... You know, being arrested is not the same as being convicted of something. People get arrested and they can get off, but you still have to disclose being arrested. Um, and then you have to explain the outcomes. But, you know, hers are continuing and escalating, so I don't think she's going to be admitted. Um, what about mental health? Does the LPAB look into mental health issues? Even this, I actually found this one quite interesting because I can see it from a breach of privacy perspective, but then it is encouraged for you to disclose it. Absolutely. So I, yeah. I'm kind of, I'm kind of, I don't know how I feel about that one because I do recall earlier with my studies that they talk about people that are solicitors and barristers that they tend to have a higher rate of mental health issues being anxiety and things like that so really? I, I honestly don't know where to sit on this one well it is it is a suitability matter um if you look at 91 m so it's about being able to satisfactorily carry out the inherent requirements of practice um so it is possible for the board, if they're aware of mental health issue, to require a report from a um, medical practitioner. They what, might. What do you mean? What what classifies as mental health? Like that you see a psychologist, or that you have schizophrenia, or like is there a line in the sand? Like is every person who's ever been to a psychologist required to? No, I don't think. Say that? Not, I don't, no, I don't think so. I think it's a situation where somebody has raised this issue in in their um, application, which is fair enough. But you'd have to look at what the severity of it was and what the implications of it of it were. So somebody who has you know, had problems at some point, they've gone and sought help and that's resolved. Well, that's not going to be, you know, that's not going to give rise to any sort of inquiry. It's a situation where, um, say, mental health has um, led to something like dishonesty or it's led to other implications. Um, it's like, um, uh, or, or led to, say, um, abuse, drug abuse would be another one. Or, or led to um, sort of commission of criminal type activities. So it's mental health. Look, lots of people have mental health issues. We have more of the population has had at one point in time, not everybody at some point. So it's, it's not that broad, but it's where it's likely to impact on your activities in the profession. That's what they're interested in. Um, and if that's the case, so if they see things in reading the application that concern them, 
they can ask for a report from whatever the appropriate specialist would be. And then that report is prepared and given to the board and then makes a decision about whether that impacts you know, on the inherent requirements of practice. So that, that's sort of it. Yeah, and it is intrusive, I agree. But it is, um, you know, they are admitting people into a profession that don't want to admit somebody who can't actually practice properly because of whatever condition they have. I know a couple of the guys from the military who've actually, they suffered from PTSD yeah. and it was pretty bad. Uh, and then they actually, they obviously did their law degree and it came up during their admission mm -hmm. process and what have you. But in reality, because they had actually shown that they tried to deal with it, they were actually working towards it, had a positive plan, they had a, yeah. a, an effective mental health plan, the admissions were quite okay with it because they were trying to sort of push into the veteran side of things to do the law su support and what have you. So yeah. I don't think it's as big a issue. No. Um, and that's all in the thing. report. And that's what's going to come gonna back happen. in that report from the, the specialist. You know, it, uh, if they're required to have medication, then they are, in fact, taking that medication. You know, they're taking that medication. If they require counselling, they're actually doing the counselling. You know, so provided all of that is happening and that that can, um, you know, deal with the issues that they have, well, that's fine. They're likely to get admitted. What they don't want to see who's somebody who is not taking their medication, who has not got, you know, undertaking any of these counselling or whatever appropriate treatment might be, has um, documented, you know, implications coming out of their condition, which is not being treated in any way. They don't want to admit somebody like that because um, they may not be capable of actually um, satisfactorily carrying out the requirements of practice. So they, there's a protection role for the public here. Um, so that's how it's how it's perceived. So Stephen, not, I, oh, sorry, I was going to say, Stephen, I'm just really curious to know, because like, yes, you talked about, um, you know, people that may potentially have mental health issues and take medications. So let's just look at anxiety in, in general. A lot of people can suffer from anxiety and yeah. they may be on medication for a long period of time. So if they're on medication for anxiety um, close to or leading up to admission or for maybe perhaps while they're studying, would that be something in your opinion that you should disclose? Yeah, I would disclose that. Yeah. But I'd also, with the disclosure, say that, that to, you know, you've, you've seen a medical practitioner, you've been prescribed, whatever it is, and that that's um, dealing with the condition. You know, and that sort of thing I don't think will be a problem. But it does need to be disclosed. Okay, we better keep going because we're, <laughs> we're really running beyond time. Okay, um, all right. So what can Elizabeth do? Well, pretty clearly, um, she's going to have problems with admission. Um, so she's going to, I think, have to come back at a later date. She's going to look, going to have to look at ways of, um, you know playing down and certainly de-escalating her activities so that she can ultimately get admitted. The other thing she can do is actually, if she doesn't accept the decision of the board, she can appeal to the Supreme Court under Section 33.2, but I don't think the Supreme Court's going to be too happy with what she's done. Um, so I'm not sure that avenue is really going to help her much. So that's basically that. Um, so let's have a look at question 10. Question 10 and question 11 are pretty similar. They've got slight differences, but they're fairly similar. So a lot of what's in question 10 will be in, in question 11 as well. Okay, so question 10 is about Mary Ann. Um, she uh, has received a warning about collusion. She got zero out of five for some particular question she did. Um, she denied the allegations. There was no academic misconduct report. Um, she gets on a train. She hasn't got a transport concession card. She gets caught by an inspector. She gets fined, gets infringement No, She pays the fine. Um, she's got a conservative family. Um, anyway, she, she starts to meet people from various cultures and she starts to be an advocate, if you like, or 
about refugee issues. So she's she's in a asylum seeker support group. Um, and they're often protesting. Um, she writes damning articles about the government, various influential people, been arrested on several occasions, um, but she's not been charged or convicted. All right, so you've got to advise her about the process of admission, and she wants to know whether she has to talk about the various activities she's been engaged in in her application. So if you're going to plan this sort of answer, say if that was an exam question, um, you can see the game is two elements, what the admission process is and then what the disclosure requirements are. So it's pretty similar to the first one in terms of the, the structure of it. Um, so you already know that you, the education requirements, you need to have your, your law degree, um, your LLB from an accredited Australian law school. You, for foreign people, you, you can have your foreign legal qualifications assessed either by LAC, the Admissions Consultative Committee, or by the LPAB, and they will look through your foreign law degree. And what they're primarily interested in looking for is whether you've met the Priestly 11 requirements. Um, in some jurisdictions, um, um, you can meet some of those. So they might accept, say, contract law, or they might accept torts or property law. The things they never accept, as far as I've seen and looking at these over the years, Constitutional law um, is never is never really met. Civil procedure sometimes, but maybe not. Uh, criminal law probably not. So it comes back, and the LPAB will write a letter to the to the person who's asked for their qualifications to be examined, saying um, we will accept these particular uh, subjects and the priestly eleven is being met by your qualifications, but you're going to have to do these other ones. So they will then have to study those other units at an Australian law school. And that's how the sort of foreign students can come in that way. Evie, can I ask you a question on that foreign stuff? Yep. With the, with just, I just want to clarify something. With the foreign um, people coming in, if they are only going to be advising on, say, a specific country, so if they're practicing in the USA and they're only here to do the USA, they get a temporary practicing certificate, don't they? They don't have to go through that whole process. So you're only talking about people who are coming here who are going to practice Australian law. Is that yeah, correct? I'm talking about the ones who want to come here and be admitted. Yeah. Okay, cool. And you have other ones that, that, that come in and, and they, usually they come into large law firms for short periods of time and talk about, you know, in relation to work on specific, very specific specialist issues. So it's a different sort of situation for them. But oh, if, yeah. Yeah. if you've got I somebody who wants to be admitted, that's all. yeah, no, that's right. If you've got somebody who wants to be admitted, they have to go through this other more lengthy process. Okay, all right. So you know the education requirements, we've done that. The application process. Okay, so if you look at that, um, 21 days prior to uh, admission, you've got to file a notice of intention to apply in Form 9. That has to be published in the Queensland Law Reporter and costs you $161.70. You've got to get these time frames right. Um, and there's a distinct order. And then, um, so that's going to be published at least 14 days, not more than 28 days prior to admission. If you stuff up your dates, you've got to start again. And they will, they will check these dates when you're going for admission. So make sure you map it out in a little timeline so you don't get it wrong. Um, then um, 21 days, at least 21 days prior to the admission, then you're going to provide the board with all sorts of documents, copy of the application. And there's a great long list of these things. I won't go through all of them because I'll set it out in the answer guide I give you. But um, uh, and then um, you've got to pay a fee, and the current fee is $671. That's the board's fee to actually review and analyze your application. Um, 12 days prior to admission, you've got to file an affidavit of compliance. Uh, and that's the filing fee of $76.05 to the Supreme Court Registry to do that. So there's all these little fees. Um, well, they're not little, some of them are quite large. 671 is pretty steep, I think, for admission. But anyway, um, that's a fee that's got to be paid. So they do provide you a checklist of things, um, and you have to follow that. 
And then um, once you've done all of that, um, then they will analyze your application and if they're happy with it, then they'll make the recommendation to the Supreme Court and you know you can go along uh, to admission ceremony. I, I think they've started doing the admission ceremonies again. With COVID, they stopped doing it, but you know, they've started doing it again, I think now. And you get usually get somebody to move your admission. So most people get a barrister. Um, sometimes a solicitor does it as well. And there's a real pecking order as to who goes first, depending on seniority and whatever, um, as you'll see when you get to that point. Okay, all right. So what about Mary Ann's disclosure? What should she disclose? Should she disclose this academic misconduct? Yes. Definitely, yeah, she should. But it's it's really on the minor end, isn't it? Um, she, you know, um, she lost five marks, basically. So it's, it's, this, it's not a really serious example. So um, I'm not sure that's going to prevent her being admitted, I doubt, or delayed. Uh, political activity. Again, you talk about the Re B case, Re Julius case, but it's not a serious, it's not really serious again, is it? You'd certainly disclose it, but it's not likely to prevent admission because there were no charges or anything like that. All right. Um, so disclosure of the arrest should be made. Failing to disclose these things would have been a bigger problem if it had then been brought to the attention of the courts, as we mentioned earlier. That can, um, it's a, that's a form of dishonesty, which is much more serious. So I don't think really anything she's done is going to um, create any, any sort of problem for her. But it all should be disclosed. That's really that one. I'm just going a little bit quicker because we're running out of time. But I'll give you a full answer for this so you can work your way through it, but that's the gist of it. What about the next one? The next one, it's got a lot more to it, hasn't it? This is, this is a case of where somebody's reformed themselves. Okay, so you've got a person here um, who's now 28, but has had a pretty colorful and probably, not probably, but actually quite tragic past, haven't they? Um, but they've managed to extract themselves out of the situations they've been in the past and essentially have um, gone from a situation where they probably would of good fame and character to a situation where they could argue they certainly could now come within the definition of good fame and character. So, um, you know, they've got um, offences for soliciting. Um, they have been associated with a fight with um, been charged with manslaughter, although the charges were dropped. So there are quite serious things in the past. So that was at the age of 20, they're now 28. So it's eight years ago. Um, 21, really. So, you know, there was all this stuff with prostitution that sort of ended when, when she turned 21. And then she's. Um, She's, there's been a situation over payment of government allowance. So that's like the Centrelink thing I was talking about earlier. Um, but she repaid the amounts when it was discovered. She was saying she was not aware of it and no further action was taken. So that's not a serious situation. And she's provided repayment. So when you look through all of that, all of these things have to be disclosed. But her argument is that despite all of these things, she's now a fit and proper person because she's changed a life. So what do you think? Is that a, what do you think about that sort of situation? Uh, Stephen, I think that uh, not paying public transport fees for 14 times is a re from 1981 again, lack mm -hmm. of honesty and dealing with authority. So what will she need to counter that? What's her other argument against that? She can argue that she was 12 years old, it was a long time ago, and she's reformed since. Exactly. And I think that I think the board would buy that. You know. And there's not a lot of, you know, it's not a recurrence of that dishonesty situation. People can reform themselves. Boards are particularly um, 
uh, hesitant, to put it that way, to readmit anybody who's been struck off for a breach of trust accounting. Any trustee, basically, if you've got a trust accounting offence where you've been struck off, that's it. You, 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 you're basically out of the profession pretty much for good. I don't recall a situation where anybody's come back from that sort of dishonesty with solicitors' trust accounts. I've known people who've tried for many years to come back, but realistically, your career has ended at that point. Um, but this particular instance, it's a long time ago, young, hasn't reoccurred. I think that's probably okay. Um, what about the public transport stuff? So, needs to be disclosed, express remorse. Uh, hasn't happened since you were 17. Um, so, you know, I think that would be okay as well. Um, so past criminal behaviour doesn't necessarily prevent you uh, from being admitted, but it'll certainly be looked at pretty thoroughly, especially stuff involving dishonesty. Um, so this one, she had a, a situation of, I think she was arrested, wasn't she, for in relation to manslaughter, but wasn't ultimately charged and nothing came of it. So um, it still should be disclosed, but unlikely to prevent her admission. Um, overpayment, again, that can be explained. And she um, can argue she was unaware. I suppose a lot of people will say they're unaware of it. But when she became aware of it, um, she repaid the money. So, you know, errors in Centrelink are common. Um, if it's, if once it's, um, once, a, once somebody is aware of it, they then repay it, especially if they're the ones that make the repayment rather than Centrelink can identify it and then request payment and then they pay it. If you voluntarily pay it and say, oh, look, there was an error there, that's a better situation. The next situation is where Centrelink discovers it and asks you to pay up and then you pay. And then the, the, the worst sort of situation is where it's of such an amount that Centrelink doesn't even give you the opportunity, or they give you the opportunity to repay, but they feel that it's such a large amount that they actually prosecute you. That's the worst case scenario. Okay, so hers is at the really low end of that. Um, so I don't think that's going to be a problem for her. She's, um, she's repaid it as soon as she was aware of it. Um, so there's now a 12 year gap, I think, since the last of, um, offense. So I don't think she's going to be prevented and she can mount, I think she's got a good case to argue that she's turned her life around and, and that um, she should be admitted. I mean, do you agree with that? I mean, that's, that's the way I'd see it. What do you think? Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I agree. I think she'd make a good lawyer. Well, she's certainly got plenty of experience, hasn't she? So it's, um, it'll, it'll give you a different perspective in the law firm. Yeah. Okay, so there you go. So you think you're comfortable with the admission process? You know what you because you're going to have to do this fairly soon. For some of you, it'll be pretty soon. So you know what, uh, once you've done your PLT, some of you may in fact be doing your PLT. Uh, oh, no, you can't. You've got to do, have done all of your priestly units. You've only got to do two, uh, only have two electives outstanding, you can start. So it'll be fairly soon, I suspect, for some of you. So um, you'll at least know what to do and what you need to disclose. Um, all right, any other questions about this week's materials? No? All right. So just to clarify, for next week, you're going to have someone from QLS. So yes. you will so be yeah, an hour so for them. So um, I'm not sure how long they're going to take. <laughs> so I haven't talked to them yet. I know Staffordshire for many, I went to you through uni with him. So he's the head of the ethics area at um, Pension Law Society. So I did ask him to, because um, because we've got various uh, topics like trust, uh, not trust, costs and liens and trust accounting. So I thought I, I asked him whether he'd do something on actually how they do trust accounting audits and what they look for and what they find. So hopefully you'll talk. I haven't had a chance to even talk to him to find out. And I'm not sure how long he's going to take. I said that we had an hour, but he mightn't take all of it, in which case um, 
we'll just work around that. And um, but I will give you the answer guides. Uh, I might give some of those in advance. I'll, how about I give you all of the trust accounting ones in advance, so that you can work your way through those. Um, and then if um, if we have time next week, if you've got particular questions about any of the trust accounting stuff or any or even cost and liens for that matter, but I suspect it'll be more about trust accounting, um, then we can discuss those. Where and, are you uploading the answer guides to? Is it to anywhere in particular or is it Yeah, each? where I put them, if you actually have a look under each tile for each week, yep. so the recording I'm doing now is actually, I just put it on a, a YouTube link. So it's there and you just click on it and it plays. But also the answer guides, I post them up. And you know how you've got the question and then a thread? Mm -hmm. It's in the, the question thread. Okay. Yeah, that's so they're there from last week and the week before as well. And I'll do them again tonight. Okay. And, and I'll do the trust. I'll put up the trust accounting ones as well. Okay. So that'll you know, just try and spread out the load a little bit because I know there's a lot in week four. Okay. Can you just elaborate, and I haven't looked at the um, the profile for this term, but the quizzes, can you just sort of give us a quick rundown of how that looks and things like that? Or have we yeah, run out? Yeah. So, well, well, I will do it closer to the quizzes, but basically they um, uh, they have six choices, um, like six, but it might be a combination answer. Like, for example, um, uh, it'll have a question and then it might have, um, but the question might be set out in such a way that it has components within it. And then so the actual answers will be A, C and B or A, D and E or so you do need, it does test you thoroughly about whether you understand the materials. Um, but um, look, people have been doing these quizzes for years and I add new questions in and have take questions out and they're randomly allocated and all the rest of it. But um, that's the sort of structure of them. Um, so you do need to know your stuff. Uh, you've got, I think it's 90 minutes to do it. I think there's, from memory, I think there's 30 questions. So there's not a lot of time per question. But, you know, if you've gone through and you've, and you're, and you've done your readings and you've had a look at the, the legislation and done the tutorial problems, you're not going to have any problem with the quiz at all. Um, so don't be, you know, scared of the quiz. Will there be stuff on the cases, like in terms of this case found yep. this outcome? Yep. Yeah, could be. Yep, absolutely. Yep. yep. So you do need to know the main case. I mean, we don't have a lot of cases. So, and they're interesting cases. So they're not actually hard to remember, which is one positive um, with this subject. It's not like the civil procedure case, it's a bit drier. <laughs> and the other question is are they all multiple choice then in that, or yeah. are they like, yeah? Yeah, they're all multi-choice. There's no short answers or anything. Yeah. 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 Look, I don't think you'll be too worried about the, the actual quiz once you've done one. Um, it's always the unknown with these things that people worry about. But if you've done the work, you want, you know, you're not going to have any problem with it. And some of them are Thank just you. common, some of them are common sense. All right. Okay. People have got to go to another unit. So we'll stop there and we'll see how Stafford does next week. Excellent. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you, Steve. See you next week. Bye-bye.